Good morning. Good morning. I'm Phyllis Ellis, a.k.a. Sojourner Truth. <laughs> Welcome to our event today. We're here with our Black History Month event. Black History Month. Black History Month is an annual observance originating in the United States where it is also known as the African American History Month. It has received official recognition from governments in the United States and Canada, and more recently has been observed in Ireland and the United Kingdom. February is dedicated as Black History Month, honoring the triumphs and struggles of African Americans throughout US history. While there are so many Black Americans we can celebrate, we have chosen 11 Black Americans that we will be celebrating today. Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Garrett Morton, Rosa Parks, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Thurgood Marshall, Shirley Chisholm, President Barack Obama, and Vice President Kamala Harris. Let me take a moment to recognize Mayor Sullivan. <laughs> Jack Lally is in the house. I don't think I see any more officials here. She is? Oh, there she is. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Okay, first up is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was an African, uh, was an American abolitionist and social activist. Born into slavery, Tubman escaped and subsequently made 13 missions to rescue approximately 70 slaves, including family and friends using the network of anti-slavery activists and safe houses known as the Underground Railroad. Here portraying Harriet Tubman is Leona Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. I grew up a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty, having no experience of it then I was not happy or contented. Every time I saw a white man, I was afraid of being carried away. Slavery is the next thing to hell. If a person would send another into bondage, he would, appears, it appears to me, be bad enough to send him into the hell if he could. I have heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them. Now, I've been free. I know what a dreadful condition slavery is. I have seen hundreds of escaped slaves, but I never saw one willing to go back and be a slave. We would rather stay in our native land if we could be free and we would make a home for them in the north. And the Lord helping me, I would bring them all here. I had reasons this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had a right to. That was liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. For no man should make me take me alive I should fight for my liberty as long as my strength lasted. And when the time came for me to go, the Lord would let them take me. God's time is always near. He set the North Star in the heavens. He gave me the strength in my limbs. He meant I should be free. When I found I had crossed that line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person, there was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. There was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. But let me tell you one thing about this Harriet Tubman. <laughs> I was a conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years. Uh -huh. And I can say what most conductors cannot say. I never ran a train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. <laughs> <laughs> Corner, cor 
cornered by, cornered by armed slave catchers on a bridge over a raging river, Harriet Tubman knew she had two choices, give herself up or choose freedom and risk her life by jumping into the rapids. <laughs> I'm going to be free or I'm going to die. <laughs> As she slayed 300 slaves by jumping off that bridge, she was known as the Moses of the people. Thank you. That was very good. <laughs> Frederick Douglass, born February 8, 1818, died February 20, 1895. Frederick Douglass was an American social reformer, abolitionist, orator, writer, and statesman. After escaping from slavery in Maryland, he became a national leader in the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York, becoming famous for his oratory and incisive anti-slavery writings. He is famous for What to a Slave is the Fourth of July. Here portraying Frederick Douglass is Apostle Edward Campbell. Mr. President, friends and fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly, most frankly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the to exercise of my limited powers, speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for, this, for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally Consider, consider, excuse me, amen, considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that mine will not be so considered. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The little experience I have had addressing public meetings in country schoolhouses Availed me nothing on the present occasion. The papers and palace cards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way, for it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall, and to address many who, who now honor me with their presence. But neither their familiar faces nor perfect gauge, I think I have a Corinthian hall, seems to free me from embarrassment. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between the platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable and the difficulties to overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as a gratitude you will not Therefore, be surprised if in what I have to say, I evince no elaborate preparation, nor grace my speech with any high sounding exodome. With little experience and with less learning, I have been able to throw my thoughts hastily and imperfectly together. And trusting to your patience and generous indulgence, I will proceed to lay them before you. 
The madness of the course we believe is admitted now, even by England, but we fear the lesson is wholly lost on our present ruler. Opposition makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if they did not go mad, they became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, holy and curable, and they call it calling capacity. Brave man, there is always a remedy for opposition. Just hear the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It, is what, it was a startling idea, much more so than we. At this distance of time, regarded it, the mind, the purity, as has been intimidated of that day, were of course shocked and alarmed by it. Such people lived then, had lived before, and will probably ever have a place on this planet. And their course in respect to any great change, no matter how great the good to be attended, are the wrong to be redressed by it. May the calculated with as much precision as can be the course of the stars. They hate all changes, but silver, gold, and copper change. Of this sort of change, they always strongly favor. God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow and every clime be understood. The claims of human brotherhood and each return for evil, good, not blow for blow. The day will come all feuds to end and change into a faithful friend each four. God's being the hour, the glorious hour, when none on earth shall exercise a lordly power, nor in triance and triance presence cower, but all to manhood statue tower. By equal birth, that hour will come to each, to all, and from his prison house, the thrall God, the, the thrall go forth. Until that year, day, hour arrive, with head and heart and hand, I'll strive to break the road and rain the garb. The spoiler of this prayer deprived, so witness heaven and never from any chosen post, whether the peril or the coast be driven. God bless you. Truth, born in Ripton, New York, and died November 26, 1883. Sojourner Truth was an American abolitionist of New York Dutch heritage and a women's rights activist. Truth was born into slavery in Swatterkill, New York, but escaped with her infant daughter to freedom in 1826. Known for her Ain't I a Woman speech, the main purpose of Sojourner's Truth Ain't I a Woman speech is to highlight the experience of hardships African-American women have faced 
These hardships include slavery and injustice. The speech emphasizes the need for women's rights and equality. The speech was delivered in the women's, at the Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851. And here portraying Sojourner Truth is moi, Phyllis Ellis. <laughs> Well, children, since there's so much racket going out here, something be something wrong in kilter. Twist the Negroes of the South and the white women of the North all talking about rights. These white men are going to be in a pretty fix pretty soon. But what's here they talking about? That man over there says women needs to be helped in the carriages and lift over ditches and always giving their best life. Ain't nobody help me in no carriage or lift me over no mud pedals or show me no best life. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and planted into barns, and no one can best me. And ain't I a woman? I can work as hard and eat as much as a man when I can get it. And ain't I a woman? I have born 13 children and seen most of them sold into slavery. And when I cried out for my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? And then they talk about this thing in the head. This thing in the head. What they call it, honey? Intellectual. That's it. What that got to do with Negroes' white and women's rights? <laughs> if my cup only holds a pipe and yours holds a quart, wouldn't it be mean of you not to let me have my half measure filled? And that little black man over there, he said women can have much as rights as men because Christ was the woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man ain't had nothing to do with it. If the first woman God put on earth to show people, oh God, I messed up. <laughs> if the first person on, if the first woman on earth was strong enough to turn this world upside down again, then these women right here should be all right to turn it back. And we should let them. So men, you should let them. Oh, Sojourner. It was a blast you guys hear me today, but now I ain't got nothing else to say. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Phew. <laughs> Garrett Morgan, born March 4th, 1877, and died July 27th, 1963. Garrett Augustus Morgan Sr. was an American inventor, businessman, and community leader. His most notable inventions were a three-position traffic signal and a smoke hood notably used in a 1916 tunnel construction disaster rescue. Morgan was famous for patenting the first traffic signal in the United States. Morgan himself, an automobile owner, witnessed a crash between a car and a buggy. This event supposedly convinced the inventor to create the stoplight. On November 20th, 1923, Morgan received his patent. And here to portray Garrett Morgan is Miles Jackson. Oh, shucks now. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I was an American inventor, businessman, and community leader. And like Sojourner said, I had a number of in inventions, like the traffic signal, the uh, smoke hood, which was eventually called the gas mask. I was born in uh, Claysville, Bourbon County, Kentucky. My father was a former slave. My mother was a former slave. I only got an education in Kentucky till I was about the seventh grade. And I had a desire to do more. So I moved up to Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. And then right over to Cincinnati, Ohio. Again, I only received the, excuse me, I only received a sixth grade education. But when I got to Cincinnati, I started to work. I worked in a uh, sewing shop, fixing sewing machines and I found interest in fixing things. So, 
my first invention was actually uh, excuse me, my first in invention was uh, attaching the zigzag um, part of uh, the sewing machine because at, before that, the sewing machine needle would get hot. So I invented the um, piece right there that would um, cool down the, the, um, the needle. So in 1907, I opened a sewing machine shop. Later on, one year later, I, with my wife, Marianne, I opened the Morgan's Cut Rate Ladies Clothing Store. I had eventually had about 32 employees. And then became the exciting part of my career. I invented the safety hood smoke protection device because at that time, firemen would go into a fire without just their helmets. There was no apparatus. So a lot of them died, got sick, so I decided to invent a smoking hood. Basically, it was a, a canvas, strong canvas hood that went over your head, but it had, a, it had attachments of tubes running all the way down to the ground because I figured gases and smoke rise. So you did have some clean air under, at the bottom by the floor. So you'd put the attachment on the hood on your head. You had the... Um, the tubes, but the key was I had charcoal filters um, that were wet inside the tubes. So if any smoke would get in, it was it was um, filtered. So let's see here. So that big time it happened. Um, let's see, it happened July twenty fourth, nineteen sixteen. Um, Cincinnati was building a tunnel underneath the Erie Lake, and a tunnel explosion happened, and there were some men trapped inside. Um, I wasn't there. I was asleep at home. There was somebody at the accident that, re that remembered that this guy, Garrett Morgan, had invented some type of smoke um, device. So he ran back to my house, got me up in the middle of the night, so I grabbed about four or five of these smoke hoods with my brother and ran down to the um, explosion site. I even still had on my pajama tops. So before I went in, I asked for volunteers. Nobody volunteered. I guess they didn't trust the brother to go in with these hoods. So me and my brother went in. Oh, there was one brave white brother that did come with us. And we went into the tunnel. And before that, there were a few people that went into the tunnel to rescue some of those um, other workers, and they never came out. So when I got in there, there were a few still alive. I put one on my back. My brother took one, and we carried him out of the tunnel, and we went back in. But before we went back in, some more of my white brothers saw that this brother's for real. He brought out some folks alive, so they put on the um, smoke hoods, and we all four of us went out, five of us went in there and brought out the rest of the survivors. We then went back in and um, got the um, our dead brothers that were in there initially. So that they made a big thing in Cincinnati, Ohio about that. They took pictures, but the mayor at that time did not want to give this black man recognition of um, re um, rescuing those people. Eventually, years later, um, the community of Cincinnati finally gave me that recognition of rescuing those folks. So, I was also given the Medal of International Association of Firefighters for that brave act. And ending in my diary, I wrote, I had but a little schooling, but I'm a graduate from the school of hard knocks and cruel treatment. I have personally saved nine lives. And one other thing, when I started to sell my hood around the country, we went around, I had to get a white brother friend of mine, and he had to act like he was the inventor. And I portrayed Big Chief Mason 
because I was the one that went into the tent that was all smoke filled because we had an example. And I went in as an Indian chief, stayed in there for 20 minutes and came out alive. So it's a shame that I had to get a white brother to help sell my wares. Um, but thank you very much for everything. And don't forget Garrett Morgan, American inventor. Thank you. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks occupies an iconic status in the civil rights movement after she refused to vacate a seat on a bus in favor of a white passenger in Montgomery, Alabama. Parks, the mother of the civil rights movement, made the decision to remain in her seat on a Montgomery, Alabama bus because she didn't believe she should have to move because of her race, even though that was the law. In the middle of the crowded bus, Parks was arrested for her refusal to relinquish her seat on December. In December, when asked to give up her seat, she simply said no. Called the mother of civil rights movement, Rosa Parks invigorated the struggle for racial equality when she refused to give up her bus seat to a white man in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. Here to portray, hold on for one second. We were going to have someone um, portray the part of the bus driver, so I'm just going to read and then Courtney's going to, okay. In Montgomery, Alabama, when the bus became full, the seats near the front were given to white passengers. Montgomery bus driver James Blake ordered Parks and three other African Americans seated nearby to move. Move, y'all. I want those two seats to the back of the bus. Three riders complied. Parks did not. Courtney. Arrest me for sitting on a bus? You may do that. I had given up my seat before, but this day was especially different. I was tired from being my work as a seamstress, and I was tired from the ache in my heart. You must never be fearful to do what you're doing when it is right. Each person must live their life as a role model. I would like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free so that others would be free too. I knew someone had to make the first step and I made mine not to move. To bring about change, you must not be afraid to take the first step. We will fail when we fail to try. I would like to be known as a person who is concerned about the freedom, the justice, equality, and prosperity for all people. I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, it does away with fear. Knowing what to do gives way to fear. Racism is still with us, but we must do what we must to prepare our children for what they will face and hopefully what we will overcome. I, I believe we are here on planet Earth to live, to grow, and to do what we can to make the world a better place for all people. I learned to put my trust in God and to see him as my strength. Long ago, I set my mind to be a free person and not to give in to fear. I always felt that I must do what is right to defend myself if I could. People always say I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically, or nor was I tired more than usual. I was not old although some, may, some people say I was. <laughs> I was 42. No, I, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was an American civil rights lawyer and jurist who served as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States from 1967 until 1991. He was the Supreme Court's first African American Justice. Thurgood Marshall was used to the fighting courts, oh, I'm sorry. Thurgood Marshall was a civil rights lawyer who used the courts to fight Jim Crow and dismantle segregation in the U.S. Marshall was a towering figure who became the nation's first black 
United States Supreme Court Justice. And here portraying Thurgood Marshall is Jamal Breakway. Hello, everybody. Hello. It's a pleasure to speak here on the anniversary of our nation's independence. As someone who relishes the ability to do and say whatever I please, independence is a concept near and dear to my heart. Because you were kind enough to invite me here, I'm not going to bore you with a speech. What I'd like to do is share a few stories, a few anecdotes of people who have understood the meaning of liberty, struggled against the odds to become free. I think of these people because of the risks they have taken and the courage they have displayed. I value them not only because of the kind of people they were, but because of the kind of nation they insisted that we become. I respect them not because of the influence they wielded, but because of the power they seized. Do you remember Heman Sweat? He was an ordinary man who had an extraordinary dream to live in a world which Afro-Americans and whites alike were afforded equal opportunity to sharpen their minds and to hone their skills. Unfortunately, in 1946, officials at the University of Texas Law School did not share this vision. Constrained by the shackles of prejudice and incapable of seeing people for who they were, they denied Heman Sweat admission to the law school solely because his color was not theirs. It was a devastating blow and a stinging rejection, a painful reminder of the chasm that separates white from Negro. Heman Sweat did not pursue liberty alone. In 1945, a couple named Shelley tried to do what white America had done for years, live in a neighborhood of their choice. But to white homeowners in, the, in Missouri at that time, such audacity was too threatening to be tolerated in their view. Whites belonged in one world and Negroes in another. They could not see the similarities that linked them to the Shelleys, the common desire to earn a living, to raise children, to own and care for a home. They saw only difference. I guess to them, if the United States was indeed a melting pot, the Negroes either didn't get in the pot or didn't get melted down. As I think back on these courageous people who came before, I wonder what became of the challenge the Sweats and the Shelleys provided. They worked for liberty. They fought for freedom. They insisted on justice. They were optimistic, as I was, that racial interaction would breed understanding, and that understanding, in turn, would produce healing and redemption. They were hopeful, as I was, that over time, America would grow toward justice and expand toward equality. Steps toward this included Smith versus Allwright, where in 1944, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for the state to delegate its authority for, this, for the date, state to the state of Texas to delegate its authority over elections to political parties in order to allow discrimination to be practiced. In Shelley versus Kramer, in 1948, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that restrictive covenants and real property deeds that prohibited the sale of property to non-whites unconstitutionally violated the equal protection provision of the 14th Amendment. And then there was Brown versus the Board of Education, when in 1954, when the U.S. Supreme Court found that racially segregated schools were inherently discriminatory and violated the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, guaranteeing all citizens equal protection under the laws of the United States. I wish I could say that this nation has traveled far along the road to social justice and that liberty and equality were just around the bend. I wish I could say that America has come to appreciate diversity and is see and accept similarity. The legal system can force open doors and sometimes even knock down walls, but it cannot build bridges. That job belongs to you and me, Afro and white, rich and poor, educated and illiterate. Our fates are bound together. We can run from each other, but we cannot escape each other. We will only attain freedom if we learn to appreciate what is different and muster the courage to discover what is fundamentally the same. America's diversity offers so much richness, richness and opportunity. Take a chance, won't you? 
knock down the fences that divide, tear apart the walls that imprison, reach out, freedom lies on the other side. We should have liberty for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an American Baptist minister and activist, one of the most prominent leaders in the civil rights movement from 1955 until his assassination in 1968. His leadership was fundamental to that movement's success in ending illegal segregation of African Americans in the South and other parts of the United States. King rose to national prominence as head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which promoted nonviolence tactics, such as the massive march on Washington in 1963 to achieve civil rights. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. And here, portraying Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. is Tony Branch. <laughs> Let us bless the Lord with a hand clap before I begin. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as one of the greatest demonstrations for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. A momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself exiled in his own land. Yes, I, so I say to you today, we are here to dramatize a shameful condition. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, rise up, and live out the true meaning of its creed. The creed being we hold these things to be truths, to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day, on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state which is sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the contents of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream today down in Alabama with his vicious racist governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Yes, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join their hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall come together. Y'all not talking back to me. This is the hope. This is the faith that goes back to the south. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountains of despair into a stone of hope. With this faith, we will
will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful sympathy of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together and pray together, struggle together, go to jail together, stand in freedom together, knowing that one day we will all be free. This will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing the, with new meaning, my country, tears of fee, sweet land of liberty, all the I sing, let there my with, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from mountains, let freedom ring. Yeah. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let it, so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Uh-huh. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the height in Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of California, of Colorado, my apologies, Lord. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the stone mountains of Georgia. Let freedom ring from the lookout mountains of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mo hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, let freedom ring, let it ring. And when we all allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and from every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, both black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. here today we really appreciate you coming out even though it's very cold um malcolm x malcolm x was a minister a leader in the civil rights movement and supporter of black nationalism he urged his fellow black americans to protect themselves against white aggression by any means necessary a stance that often put him at odds with the nonviolent teachers of martin luther king jr Malcolm X condemned whites, whom he referred to as the white devil, for the historical oppression of blacks. He argued for black power, black self-defense, and black economic autonomy, and encouraged racial pride. Here now to portray Malcolm X is Rosan Hall. <laughs> Salam alaikum. <laughs> this afternoon, we want to talk about the ballot or the bullet. We must understand the politics of our community and we must know what politics is supposed to produce. We must know what role politics plays in our lives. And until we become politically mature, we will always be misled and led astray or deceived and maneuvered into supporting someone who politically doesn't have our community's good interest at heart. So the political philosophy of black nationalism only means that we will be able to carry forward a political program of re-education to open our people's eyes and make sure that we become more politically conscious politically mature and when we will whenever we get ready to cast our ballot that ballot will be cast for a man of the community who has the good of the community at heart why does this loom to be such an explosive political year well because this is the year of politics this is the year when all of the white politicians are going to be going into the negro community you never see them until election time you can't find them until election time. 
They're going to come with their false promises. And then they come with these false promises that's going to feed our frustrations. And this will only make matters worse. Now, now I'm not a, a, a politician. I, I'm not a student of, of politics. I'm, I'm not a Republican. Uh, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not even an American. And I've got the sense to know that. And so when we open our eyes today and look around America, we see not through the eyes of someone who has enjoyed the, the fruits of Americanism. We see America through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of Americanism. We don't see the American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. We've not benefited from democracy. We've only suffered from America's hypocrisy. And the generation that's coming up now can see it. And they're not afraid to say it. If you go to jail, so what? You go to jail, if you black, you was born in jail. If you were black, you were born in jail in the North as well as the South. And it's not talking about the South. Anything South of the Canadian border is South. <laughs> so I say in my conclusion, the only way we're going to solve it is we've got to unite. We've got to work together in unity and in harmony, and black nationalism is the key. How are we going to overcome the tendency to be at each other's throats that will always exist in our neighborhood? And the reason this tendency exists is the strategy of the white man has always been to divide and conquer. He will divide us, keep us divided so that he can conquer us. He tells you that I'm for separation and that you're for integration. No, I'm not for separation, and you're not for integration. What we are both for is freedom. And so you think separation is going to get you, is going to get me freedom, and you think integration is going to get you freedom. We just want the same thing, but we're just going at it a different way. And so the gospel of, of black nationalism, as I told you, means that you should control your own political, uh, your, your, the politics in your own community the economy in your community, and all of the society in which you should be, should be under your control. And once you, once you feel that this philosophy will solve your problem, then, then go join any church where that's preached. Now, now, don't go join a church where they're preaching white nationalism. And you, know, and you can go to a Negro church and they're preaching white nationalism. When you, when you walk into the church and you see a white Jesus and a white Mary and a white angel, they're preaching white nationalism. But if you go to a church and that preacher is preaching a philosophy and a program that's designed to bring black people together and to elevate black people, then join that church. Join that church. If you, if you see where the NAACP is preaching and practicing that which is designed to make black nationalism materialize, join the NAACP. Join any kind of organization, civic, religious, fraternal, political, or otherwise, that is based on lifting up the black man and making him the master of his own community. It will be the ballot or the bullet. It will be liberty or it will be death. And if you are not ready to pay that price, keep the word freedom out of your vocabulary. <laughs> All righty then. retired politician who served as the 44th president of the United States from 2009 to 2017. A member of the Democratic Party, Obama was the first African-American president of the United States. His story is the American story, values from the heartland, a middle-class upbringing and a strong family, hard work and education as the means of getting ahead, and the conviction that a life so blessed should be lived in a service to others. Here, portraying Perez President Barack Obama is Mr. Robert Jenkins. <laughs> My fellow citizens, I stand here humbled by the task before us, grateful for the trust you bestowed, mindful of the sacrifice of our ancestors. Forty-four Americans have taken this presidential oath 
The words have been spoken during rising tides of prosperity in the still waters of peace. Yet every so often, the oath is taken amidst gathering of clouds and raging storms. At these moments, America has carried on simply because of the skill, not of the skills or the visions of those in high office, but because we the people have remained faithful to the ideas of our forebearers in the truth of the founding documents. So it has been, so it must be with this generation of Americans that we are in the midst of a crisis we now know well understand. Our nation is in a war against a far reaching network of violence, yes. hatred. Our economy is badly weakened. The consequence from the consequence of greed, irresponsibility on parts of others, but that's also our collective failure to make hard choices and prepare this nation for the new age. Homes have been lost, jobs have been shed, businesses have shuttered, our health care is too costly, our schools have failed too many. Each day brings further evidence that the ways we use energy strengthens our adversaries and threatens our planet. These are indicators, indicators of the crisis subject to data and statistics. Less measurable but no less profound is the, sap, the sapping of the confidence across our land. A, na a nagging fear that America is declining is, is inevitable. The next generation must lower its sights. Today I say to you that the challenge we face is real. There are serious, they are many, they will not be met easily or in a short span of period. But know this, America, they will be met. On this day, we gather because we have chosen hope over fear, unity of purpose over conflict and discord. On this day, we come to proclaim an end to the petty grievances and the false promises and the rec reclamation of worn out dogma that for far too long has strangled our politics. We remain a young nation, but in the words of scripture, the time has come to put away these childish things. The time has come to reaffirm our enduring spirit, to choose our better history, to carry forward the precious gift, the noble ideas, pass from generation to generation, the God-given promise that all are equal, all are free, all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. In reaffirming this greatness, our nation, we understand the greatness is never a given. It must be earned. Our journey has never been one of shortcuts or settling for less. It has not been the path of the faint hearted for those who prefer leisure over work or seek only the pleasures of riches and fame. Rather, it has been the risk it has been the risk takers, the doers, the makers of things. Some celebrate it, but more often men and women of obscure labor who have carried us up the long rugged path towards prosperity and freedom. For us, they packed up their few worldly possessions, traveled across oceans in search of a new life. For us, they toiled in sweatshops, settled the West, endured the lash of the whip, and plowed the hard earth. For us, they fought and died in places like Concord, Gettysburg, Normandy, Con Saquon, time and again, these men and women struggled and sacrificed and worked till their hands were raw so that we might live a better life. They saw America as bigger than the sum of its individual ambitions, 
greater than all our differences of birth or wealth or factions. This is a journey we continue today. We remain the most prosperous, powerful nation on earth. Our workers are no less productive than they were when this crisis began. Our minds are no less inventive. Our goods and services are no less needed than they were last week, last month, or last year. Our capacity remains undiminished, but our time of standing pat or protecting these narrow interests and putting off unpleasant decisions, that time has surely passed. Starting today, we must pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and begin again working to remaking America. Thank you. Vice President Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is an American politician and attorney who is the 49th and current Vice President of the United States. She is the first female Vice President and the highest ranking female official in U.S. history, as well as the first African American and first Asian American Vice President. She was sworn in on January 20th, 2021, and we're going to reenact that date. We have her being sworn in by Mayor Robert Sullivan. And Jack Lally is her husband, so take it away, guys. <laughs> All right. Madam Vice President-elect, Mr. Imhoff, it is my honor to swear you in as the 49th Vice President of the United States of this America. Please repeat after me. I, I Kamala Harris. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of our United States. The Constitution of our United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I. That I, Kamala Harris. Will bear true faith. Will bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance <laughs> to the same. That I. That I, Kamala Harris, take this obligation freely. Take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I, and that I, Kamala Harris, will well and faithfully, will well and faithfully, discharge the duties, <laughs> discharge the duties, of the office, of the office, on which I am about to enter, on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Madam Vice President. to be here to stand on the shoulders of those who came before to speak tonight as your vice president in many ways this moment embodies our character as a nation it demonstrates who we are even in dark times we not only dream we do we not only see what has been but we see what we can do we shoot for the moon and then we plant our flag on it. We are bold, fearless, and ambitious. We are undaunted in our belief that we shall overcome, that we will rise up. This is American aspiration. In the middle of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln saw a better future and built it with, hand, with the land-grant college, co colleges and the Transcontinental Railroad. In the middle of the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King fought for racial justice and e economic justice. American aspiration is what drove the women of this nation throughout history to demand equal rights. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the authors of the Bill of Rights to claim freedoms that had really been written down before. A great experiment takes great determination. The will to do the work and then the wisdom to keep refining, keep tinkering, keep perfecting. The same determination is being realized in America today. I see it in the scientists who are transforming the future, our future, I see it in the parents who are nurturing generations to come. 
in the innovators, in the educators, in everyone, everywhere who is building a better life for themselves, their families, and their communities. This, too, is American aspiration. This is what President Joe Biden has called upon us to summon now. The courage to see beyond crisis, to do what is hard, to do what is good, to unite, to believe in ourselves, believe in our country, believe in what we can do together. Thank you, and may God bless America. Guys, oh, I wish we can keep on going, but I would like to thank you and for you to meet our cast. So when I call your name, please stand up, guys, and take another bow. Leona Martin is Harriet Tubman. <laughs> Apostle Campbell as Frederick Douglass. Yeah. Phyllis Ellis as Sojourner Truth. <laughs> Apostle Campbell, come up to the front. Miles Jackson as Garrett Morgan. Courtney Henderson as Rosa Parks. Jamal Breakaway as Thurgood Marshall. Tony Branch as Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yay! Rasan Hall as Malcolm X. Robert Jenkins as President Barack Obama. And Sidney Marrow as Vice President Kamala Harris. Appearance by Robert Su Mayor Robert Sullivan yeah. and Jack Lally <laughs> as the husband. <laughs> Take a bow. A bow. Are we all set?